Well, we've, we've spent some time in the book of John. And at the end of the book of John, we left Jesus and Peter. And, and Peter um, has taken a bad rap, and, and sometimes for good reasons, Peter has taken a bad rap. But this was Peter before the power of the Holy Spirit had grabbed him. And over the next uh, five weeks, we're going to be looking at the difference in the life of a person when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of their lives. We're not getting any more of God than we've already have of God. But how much more of us is he going to get? And that's where that's where it comes down to. He said, God, give me more of you. Give me more of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm giving you all of myself. Now, how much of you do I have? And so we're going to be looking at at this guy who was there, was faithful, was bold, was sometimes unwise and fell big time. And then Jesus came back to him and he restored him. But, you know, he still didn't get it all, even after that restoration, kind of like us sometimes, huh? We've been born again. We've been been given his Holy Spirit and we still mess up sometimes. But God isn't done with us yet and he doesn't leave us out there and he doesn't condemn us. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I think back to my first year at a number five school, middle school, back in 2012. Um, I had this amazing class, 21 seventh grade boys. And, and people said, you must be crazy. Oh, I was in my element. I had 21 seventh grade boys. And they said, how could you take seventh grade boys? You have to understand that they're not complete yet. Um, and, you know, so, you know the, the, the brains haven't fully developed. Um, they they are, are weird in their ways. And when you understand that, you can enjoy them. Now, better 21 seventh grade boys than 21 seventh grade girls. Because there was a class next door with a little more than 21 seventh grade girls. Um, I got to cover a class for them once during that year and said, never again. Um, I, I'd rather go back and, and teach um, kindergarten. I did that for a week, and that was the hardest week of my life and uh, of my school life. Um, but a week of kindergarten is nothing like one period of seventh grade girls. But, so, so I had these seventh grade boys. <clears throat> um, I, on the first day, you know, I had to establish my position as alpha male in the class. And uh, so you don't have to yell, you just get deeper. And, um, and, and these guys, most of them had not had a male teacher, so having this guy come from in front of them, and I'm Mr. Johnson, and, and they hadn't seen me, and, and this was a K-8 school, so some of these kids had been there since kindergarten, and they had not seen me around, so I had to establish that. Well, one of my students missed the first couple of days, and when he came back to school, he came back to establish his position of alpha male. So we had this conflict, and, and, and I had to let him know yeah, you know what, there's one adult in this classroom, and I'm getting paid. Um, this is my class. I'm being gracious in letting you women into my class. And I um, didn't have anything else I could do, but I told him that. So we struggled for pretty much the first half of the year. And, and I began to pray for, for this kid, and, and, and he graciously carried a 65 average. If any of my students ever asked me, Mr. Johnson, how come you gave me a D? I would tell them, because I like you, because you can't earn a D. And so he had this, you know, and I began to see him, and I began to see his character, and I began to see those uh, qualities that he had, and, and began to pray for him. And somewhere along the line, God made it click. I don't remember how, I don't remember when, but we clicked. And I began just to speak life into this kid. And the third marking period, his average was over a 90. He went from 65 to like 95. Uh, He told me that he wanted to prove to me that he could do it. And and then he was ready. He says, now I can go back. I says, no. I said, now what you need to realize is in this class, if you have gone over a 90, if you go under a 90, you get an F. He said, what? I said, yeah. I said, once you've proven that you can get an A, it's either A or an F in my class. 
And, and I had a group of guys, my A students on, on, on the first row, um, I, I say, guys, and they said, yeah, you can't get anything below a 90 in this class anymore. And you know, he, now, could he? Um, probably, but I wasn't telling him that. And he maintained over 90 average for the rest of the year. Um, why? Because somebody spoke into his life. The ability was there, but the, the, the motivation wasn't there. Um, the, the caring wasn't there. But here's the problem. After he left my class that year, he didn't do well. Why? Because the influence wasn't there. The, the life speaking wasn't there. The, the, the praying for him daily, because I had to see him daily, wasn't there anymore. He was only empowered by the accountability that he had with me. I, I would learn that in the next years, his life began to spiral downhill. And you know, that's kind of how it was with Peter. I, I thought about when, when I thought about them, him, I, I thought about Samson and, and Judges 16, when it says he awoke from his sleep and said, I, I will go out at the same times and shake myself free. But he did not. This is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. God was there, and when God was there, he was able to do all kinds of things that no human should have been able to do. But God had rejected him, and God had left him. At that time in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on a person for a certain period of time for a certain job. But there were times when he would just leave, when he would withdraw his presence and his power from people. That's Old Testament. Next week, when, when we look at chapter two, we'll see that with the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, when he came into the life of the believer, he's there. He's not coming and going. We sometimes come and go, but he doesn't. <clears throat> In verse Samuel chapter 16, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him amidst the brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel went up to Ramah. The next verse is a sad verse because it says, Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul had rejected God's way of doing things. And God says, I reject you as king. And because you're not king, my spirit is not going to overshadow you and give you the, the wisdom and the power to do things because you decided that your will was greater than the will of God. <clears throat> In the same way that God allowed me to speak into the life of a 13-year-old, Jesus spoke into the life of Simon, whom he would name Peter. Let's just take a quick look back of who this guy Peter was. I was looking back and... And a couple of commentators think that Peter was born somewhere around 1 B.C. Or 1, yeah, 1 B.C. <clears throat> he, he was met by Jesus in John chapter 1. And Jesus met him, <clears throat> excuse me, and Jesus said, and I even have water. <clears throat> you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. You're a rock now. Simon was a variation of Simeon, one of the sons of Jacob. That meant just hearer, someone who's heard. Not someone who's done, but someone's heard. <clears throat> you ever get in trouble with your parent? And you said to them, or your child is saying to you now, I heard you. you think, well, you heard me, but you're not doing it. And, and that's where we get sometimes. We hear the word of God. And, and I think that sometimes it's dangerous to week after week hear the word of God and there not be any change in our lives. And Peter, whose name was Hearing, would have grown up in a Jewish home, would have spent time in synagogue, would have heard about the Old Testament saints and how they did things and how God ruled over his people. He from there knew that a Messiah was coming and was looking for him. But Peter was at the place, Simon was at the place where he only heard Jesus says, now I call you Cephas, which means Peter, which means rock. In Mark chapter 1, we, we hear that Jesus saw this fisherman and he said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. 
Jesus, or he and Matt and Mark chapter five, Peter will be with Jesus, James and John when Jairus's daughter had died and he would go in with him. And Jesus took him into the inner group and he showed him the miracle of raising someone to life. In Mark chapter 14, Peter and the guys were, were going across the, the lake and across the sea. And when they were going across the sea and they looked out, they saw someone walking on water. And they were afraid. But Jesus spoke to them and said, it's me. Don't be afraid. And in Mark 14, 28, Peter says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. That was cool. You know, sometimes we get on Peter's case because Peter took his eyes off Jesus, felt the waves, felt the wind, saw what was happening, and he became afraid because his focus was messed up. He's now no longer walk, uh, walking or looking at Jesus, and then he's no longer walking on water. But at least he had enough sense to say, Lord, save me. And, and we look at Peter, but you know what? Peter was the only one who had enough faith to get out there in the first place. And sometimes, you know, believers will be that way. We'll look at people and we'll see their failures and you see why, how they're not doing what God has called them to do or how they've fallen from a high position and we've never raised there. And then in Matthew 16, we saw where Peter answers Jesus' question of who do people say the Son of Man is? It says, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, who who do you guys, who do you say that I am? And, And Peter speaks up right away and he speaks up the right thing this time. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the Peter that we're talking about. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father is who is in heaven. God the father was speaking to Peter. And he says, and I tell you, you are Peter, but on this rock I will build my church, not on you, Peter, but on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This Peter who rose to this place later on would rebuke Jesus. Now, now, could you ever, um, has any of you ever gotten bold enough to rebuke a parent um, when you were a child and live to tell about it? No, you, um, you, you, know, you know, even if you, you know they're wrong, you, you know, to rebuke your parent. I, I think the closest that I came to that with my own children is I gave them their permission to say anything to us that they wanted as long as it was with respect. And I determined if it was respectful or not. And there was a time when, you know, they would, you know, one would come to me and they would be talking to me and, say, and, and I'm, you know, I'm a fixer. So I'm trying to fix it and I don't even know what I'm fixing. And, and they said, Dad, you're talking and not listening. And I was right. That was a rebuke. It was said respectfully. And I said, you're right. And I was quiet. But could you imagine saying to Peter, saying to God, Far be it from you that you'll ever die. You're Messiah. You're the one who's going to fix all of the stuff that we wanted to be fixed. You're the one who's going to to redeem Israel. You can't die. But he had just said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You know, you know, God spoke to you and revealed to you that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. And now Satan has gotten into your head and you want to keep me from the cross. Get behind me. You are a hindrance for me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Not long after that, this same Peter with James and John went to the mountain and they saw Jesus transfigured. Jesus, a little later in the book of Matthew and chapter 26, would say that you're all going to fall away 
because of me this night. And then he says, it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised, I will go before you in Galilee. Peter said, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Then Jesus looks him right in the eye and says, I'm going to tell you something this night. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, in his boldness, in his sincerity, even if I must die with you, I will not, I will not, even though if I die with you, I will not deny you. And then the disciples said the same thing. And a little later on, before the night was over, Peter denies him three times. And we saw last week in John 21 where Jesus comes back and says, look, I need you to be back in a good place with me. And he commissioned him to feed my sheep, to tend my lambs, give them all the things that they need to do. He was letting him know that you're going to have a ministry of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and of building up believers in the faith. That's Peter. Let me suggest that Peter had been empowered by the instructions and commands of Jesus and even by his presence, but only while he was there. As Jesus spoke, Peter was able to perform. On his own and according to his own power and ability, he often came up short. It would not be until Peter was endowed with power from on high that he would be bold and powerful and consistent in his walk. And that brings us to Acts 1.8. Oh, to Acts 1, chapter 1.1. 1, 1. So Luke is writing. And as Luke is writing, he's writing to um, a friend, Theophilus, or an associate, the same person who received the, the gospel of Luke. And in verse two, he says, until the day when he was, let me, I got a verse one. Uh, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. This is where the disciples begin to get direction. Remember, I said last week that after the, the resurrection, they hadn't had direction. And Jesus had met with them on a couple of occasions, but they didn't know what to do. But now Jesus says, look, I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. Do you ever find yourself not knowing what to do? So what do you do when you don't know what to do? Um, Sometimes I just make up stuff. <laughs> you know, um, you, 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 you got to sometimes, if you never appreciate it, teachers, find a middle school and go there and spend a day. And you'll find students who, when they don't know what to do, oh, man, they make up stuff. And the stuff that a 12-year-old can do when they don't know what to do would amaze you. It would horrify you, but it would amaze you. Uh, some of us heard, we, 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 we in our adult lives, early adult lives, and some of you are young enough that when you were growing up, you heard the old Nike slogan, just do it. There are times when you have direction in your life that you are supposed to just do it, but a lot of times if you just do it, you don't have the right guidance and the Spirit of God is in control. You're just doing it, and you're going to have to let God now undo it. Do you find yourself sometimes getting ahead of God and doing his work in your own strength and timing? Well, in verse 4 of Acts 1, it says, And while they were staying with him, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But he said to them, wait. How many of us like to wait? I, I don't like to wait. I've told you before, I'm impatient in front of a microwave. You know, it's like, come on, come on. 
You know, I, I've heard about flash freezing. I want flash heating. You know, I, I want, you know, when I turn on the car in the morning, I don't want to wait for those few minutes for it to get warm. Um, I don't want to wait for my food to get done. I want it right now. Waiting is very difficult. And, and I began uh, th this week as I looked at this again and I looked at that word wait um, and, and how did that work itself out during the time of the Old Testament? Why is it so important for us to wait because many times when we don't wait, we get ourselves in predicaments that take more time. In Exodus chapter 24, 12, it says, The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone which, with the law and the commandment which I have written for the instructions. If he didn't wait, he wouldn't have gotten the law. He says, come and wait. In Numbers 9, he says, and those men said to him, we are unclean through touching a dead body. Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the people of Israel? Well, Moses hadn't dealt with this yet. And so Moses says to him in Numbers 9, 8, wait that I might hear what the Lord will command concerning you. That is so important. And instead of rushing, instead of just doing it, God wants us to wait until we get the word from him. But God, that is so hard for me to wait. David says in Psalm 25, verses 1 through 3, To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Verse 3, Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who, wantonly, who are wantonly treacherous. But I won't be put to shame. He says, look, I don't want to be put to shame. And God says, wait on me then. Wait. Don't get yourself into a position where it doesn't seem like God's ever going to show up and you do what you want to do. We talked about Saul earlier. And Saul was, was waiting for Samuel. And he got impatient. And his men got impatient. And Saul says, hey, let's sacrifice and once he is sacrificed, which was not in his right to do as king, but he needed to be a priest, then as soon as he got it done, Samuel shows up and basically says, why didn't you wait? He said, I was trying to wait, but basically you weren't showing up on time. And sometimes we get to the place in our lives where God says, wait, and we waited for a while and we wonder, well, how long do I need to wait? And we just do it on our own before the time that God says, I'm showing up. Anybody got an impatient spouse? Are you an impatient child or do you have children who are impatient? Um, I, you know, when, when I was, was pastoring, um, I was normally the first person in the building in the morning. I got there about 630 in the morning, but I was also the last person out of the building. And if the children were driving with me, were riding with me, you would get these looks um, from somewhere just sitting there. They inch their way to the back door and they would stand there. Some of the time they would get the nerve to like this. Well, we, we, we went to a, a conference in Atlanta and one of the, the guys from our home church in Philadelphia was pastoring there. And, and, and I heard my son at the end of that service in time saying, we're 700 miles from home and we're still the last ones out of the church. <laughs> didn't want to wait for me. Didn't want to wait. We know these verses in Psalm 27, which says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. And then he repeats it again. Wait for the Lord. And the one that you've been waiting for. Even youths faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Who? Those who wait for the Lord. And maybe you're, you're in a time of waiting right now, and you're getting frustrated, you're beginning to question God. You're beginning to wonder if God really said this to you at all. When, when God is saying, 
just wait. But how long, God? Just wait. How many more days? How many more weeks? How many more months? And some of you have been waiting on God for an awful long time, and it doesn't seem like he shows up. Do not go ahead in your own power and strength. Continue to wait on God. But make sure that God is staying wait, because sometimes God says wait, and sometimes then God says, okay, now let's get up and go. And you've been so used to waiting that you don't get up and go. Don't go ahead of God, but don't travel behind God. So back to the book of Acts. It says, so when they had come together in verse 6, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They still hadn't gotten it. These guys were still looking at, at a political freeing. They wanted to get up out of the, the yoke of bondage under the Romans. Jesus, when are you going to free Israel? And Jesus, man, you guys still don't get it. They would get it, but now they did not. Jesus was speaking of a kingdom far more vast than any country, empire, or political system. We often miss what God wants for us because we're looking in the wrong places for the wrong things. Acts 1, 7 said, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And then verse 8. This is going to be where we, we're going to be for the, for the next four weeks. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We've heard those verses so many times. But are we living now under the power of the Holy Spirit? It's there. We don't have to wait anymore. They didn't have to wait long. It was going to be somewhere in a 10-day period of time. Now, you're saying 10 days to wait for something is a long time. And if you need proof of that, waiting for your prime package, (laughs) waiting for your UPS package, waiting for the mail. Anybody in here like me, when I I order from from, from UPS or prime, I track that package. And I have tracked packages from China to Rochester. When when I was looking for a a present from, from Apple, um, it, it was hung up in immigration or, or, or processing in, um, in China, and, and I saw that thing two days in China, and I need to have that thing by Christmas Eve, and I tracked it to California all the way across the country until it got to my house, surprisingly, a day earlier than they said. But I didn't like the waiting. We're, we're, we're trackers, and sometimes I think we get like that with God. Well, well God, I, I am so convinced that you promised me this. But but it was on the 1st of April when you you promised me this, and we're on the 30th of April, and it still hasn't gotten there. You've been in a car, and you've been driving, and you are picking up a person at 1045, and you got there at 1030, and you waited at 1045, and they're not coming out the door at 1045. And at 1050, they're, they're still not there. And you know, okay, so this is my lesson in patience today, so I'm going to wait. You know, at 1050, it's like, hmm, ever get stuck behind a school bus and they're waiting for somebody and you're there saying, look, they're not there. Go, go, go. And, and after a period of time, they'll just go. And they don't wait really that long. What am I saying? That God is saying to you, God is saying to me, wait. Children, Wait. Adults, wait. When God has promised, God's going to come through, but wait. And Jesus is telling them, and he didn't even tell them it's going to be 10 days. Well, how do I know 10 days? Because he was with them for 40 days, and Pentecost is that 50th day after the Passover. So he says, you will be my witnesses. What do you want to do with this power? If you've ever gotten a position of authority or power, what did you do with it? Or have you ever wanted a position of authority or power? My my first job was in consumer finance, and and I was collecting. And I enjoy collecting. You got to be creative when you collect it. And then sometimes you got to get out of the office 
And you've got to go to people's houses and knock on the doors and say, hey, I'm from, the, oh, I, I, I was, yeah. And so I enjoyed that. But I wanted a position. And, and the position, um, they said, well, you need to wait about two or three years before you get this position. And I worked harder than I ever could, and I got promoted in 18 months to assistant manager. Well, as an assistant manager, they says, well, now you have to, to close loans. I'm not a detail person. And, and if you're closing a loan, you gotta be a detail person. And you know, I, I you know, close my loan, I tell my manager, look this over, and I forgot an initial. Five pages worth of stuff and signatures, and I forgot one initial, and I gotta go back. And then I was in charge of the collection department. So I had um, two or three guys and, and then the, the two cashiers and I was over them and, and I had to be in the office all day. I hated being in the office all day. I, I got a new collector and I says, I'm gonna teach you how to run a collection desk. So I let him on the phone and I went out and he, you know, and, and I did that, but I, I, I waited and I worked for 18 months, I got it sooner than I should have, and when I got it, it wasn't all that thrilling anymore. And sometimes we, we ask for something, we want something, and we wait for something, but what do we do with it when we get it? And Jesus says, you wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, but when you get the power of the Holy Spirit, follow his direction. Do the things that he has called you to do. What things? Be witnesses to me. That was all he told them at that time. You're going to be witnesses, my witnesses, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I wrote a note to myself, it says, until God shows you what to do, do the things you know to do. God wants us to be active waiters. I remember somebody saying that to me, he said, what in the world is an active waiter? When you wait, you sit down and you do nothing. Isn't that how you wait? Not when you're waiting for what God calls you to do. What are the things that I know that God wants me to do before he wants me to do that specific thing? I know that God wants me to pray. And so while I'm waiting, I'm praying. I know that God wants me to read and study the scripture. So I'm going to read and I'm going to study your word, God, while I'm waiting. God wants me to worship. He invites me to worship. And not just when we get here on Sundays. So I'm going to do that. God has told me to fellowship with believers. And so, so here and in journey groups, I'm going to fellowship with believers. I'm going to call somebody and invite them out to, to coffee or a milkshake or my new favorite, a gelato. And we're going to sit and we're going to have one of those things. And we're going to talk about the goodness of God. We're going to encourage each other. I know that I'm to be a witness. That's what God has told me to do. Whatever the work of ministry that God has given to me, until God directs me that this is the time for this specific thing, I am to do the things that I know that I'm supposed to do. Look for a need. Fill that need. Uh, so many believers are waiting to discover their gifts. And, and we're just kind of waiting. What do you mean I'm waiting to discover my gifts? I don't know how God has gifted me. So I'm going to sit here until a bolt of lightning comes. Or until I hear an audible voice, and that would so mess you up that you wouldn't do. No, so somebody told me, what do you do? You, you look for a need around the church. You look for a need in your community. You look for a need in the house. Because your gift isn't only to be operated in the church. It's for the body of Christ. But it doesn't have to happen here on a Sunday. But there are needs here on the Sunday. There are needs here on the Wednesday. There are needs at different times in the body of Christ. Got a brother who, who, who serves with um, mission share. That's a need. People who serve with the Father's heart. That's a need. Well, how do I know? I, I get involved. I, I get up. Until I know specifically what to do, I, I start doing works of ministry. And there were works of, uh, of things that I did that I didn't know that I had until somebody from the body confirmed it. They wouldn't have been able to confirm it if I hadn't done it. And so when God has given you this empowerment, it's not for you to be this good Christian with power. What good is power if you don't use it? I have had power tools. I think I need new ones. I think some of those have rusted. 
Uh, said, why'd you buy them? I said, because sometimes I have friends come by the house to work on stuff, and uh, I want them to be able to use. Uh, my, my daughter knows about my, my power stuff, and she has amazing power stuff, and she does amazing stuff. And um, she fussed at us because we didn't have a peephole in our side door that we answer. And she said, you have a camera. I mean, you have a, a ring doorbell with a camera in it. And it's not on your door. <laughs> you have the ability to see who's at your door. But it's in a box. Waiting. Until she had enough. And she came by and put it in. And so now when she comes to the door, I can mess with her because there's a voice there on it. And it's like, <laughs> well, 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 who is this? But, but, but what am I saying? There's, there were power tools that I owned that were in the basement. They didn't want any good. And like I said, some of the parts have rusted on some of those things. There was a ring doorbell in a box in an upstairs room that wasn't doing any good. God has teachers God has people who have administrative gifts. God has helpers. God has all of those things that he has placed in the body of Christ and he has given us the power for it and some of us aren't using it. Some of us aren't using it. You know what? It's very comfortable not to use it. But the body does not operate the way it's supposed to do without you. But, but I'm nobody special. Yes, you are. Because God put his spirit in you. And, he, and the spirit of God put his power on you. That makes you very special. But, but I've never gone to school. I did way more ministry. Well, not more ministry, but I did a whole lot of ministry before I ever went to Bible college. Before I went to seminary. Most people, most people who do these works of ministry will never go to a Bible college. And that's why it's so important that we're in teaching in the church. Actually, in Bible college, one of the professors said, if the church had done its job, there would be no need for Bible college. And he says, ooh, you're saying this, you're going to get fired. But it's, um, you know, but that was his thing. He said, he said, the education of the people of God comes from the church. Well, just want to show you one more thing in Acts chapter 1. So in, in verse 12, it says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. The key here, verse 14. And these with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. Together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. While they were waiting, they were praying. And when I looked at this, they were with one accord. One of the best ways to get on one accord is to be praying with people. If you're praying with somebody, if you're singing with somebody, I sure hope you're on one accord. Um, you're ministering together. You're doing the works of God together. That sets you on one accord. And then in verse 15, Peter stood up. The restored Peter. Not the empowered by the Holy Spirit Peter yet, but the, the Peter that had been restored, the Peter who was told by Jesus to go and to wait, and Peter who had prayed, and I believe in, the, in Peter's prayer, that God prompted him the same way he had prompted him to say that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, that God prompted him to say, we got to start taking care of business now. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And then Peter says, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Peter starts to change. Peter's really going to change in the next few days. What's going to be the difference? The promise of verse 8. You're going to get power 
from the Holy Spirit. And when he empowers you, you'll be able to do things that you've never been able to do, that you never went to school for, that you, you never were even, some, some of these things you were never even mentored to do. But the Spirit of God is going to do something so miraculous in your life that you're going to do stuff that will blow your own mind. You're going to do stuff that, that when, when people look at you, when you surrender to the power of the Spirit of God, they'll say, oh, that's coming from them? And especially when, when people who knew you before you were saved see you now and they see you under the power of the Holy Spirit, they're going to be amazed. No one's going to be even more amazed? You. <laughs> when you surrender to the Spirit of God and you allow him to work in you and through you, you're going to say, I can do that? Yeah, by the power of the Spirit of God, you can. So we're going to look for another four weeks at what happens when a person is empowered by the Spirit of God. And, and I trust that, that you'll be reading along over the next couple of weeks, especially through verses, uh, through chapters 4. Um, you can get a, a heads up on where Aaron and I are going to be going with this. But you need to start with, God, am I waiting well? Am, am I actively doing what you've told me to do? Am I depending not on my knowledge, not on my experience, not on my own wisdom, but I'm depending on the power of the Spirit of God to enable me to do the works of ministry that you've called me to? Going to ask the band to come back up. So where are you? Are, are you still waiting? Are you actively involved in ministry? And if you're actively involved in ministry, are you still on a daily basis relying on the spirit to do the work more than your ability? You have to ask yourself those questions. Maybe you have to surrender your gifting to God again. Maybe you have to say to God, I've been sitting on the sidelines of the kingdom of God for too long. You've called me to the playing field, but man, these seats up here on the sideline are really nice. You don't get hurt on the sidelines. You don't get injured on the sidelines. But man, you don't have the same kind of fun when you're on the sidelines. And the people on the team they don't get to experience the things that you can bring with you sitting on the sidelines. God, where do you have me? What do you want me to do? Your power is available. Will I use it? Jesus, thank you for your word. Burn it in our hearts that we would learn to live by it. In Jesus' name, amen.